Okay, now M Mark needs um, very little introduction, I think, because everyone's seen the event notice. Uh, he's a prolific writer, and towards the end of the talk, he'll talk he'll talk to you about um, the upcoming launch of his next book. Um, but we, meanwhile, we're we're also very thrilled that some of you were actually able to to get the book. Um, or are, are about to get the book um, in China. Uh, our moderator is David Moser, and he also has written a book um, about the development of, of Chinese language, and it's called A Billion Voices, and he has been a moderator um, for us before uh, on the topic of linguistics and language in China. And so um, without further ado, over to Mark, who has a PowerPoint, and then, um, and then, Mark and David will take it away with questions between them, maybe a conversation between themselves for a time and uh, with the audience Q&A. Thanks so much. Over to you, Mark. Well, thank you all for attending this evening. I want to say great thanks to Melinda and Alan for organizing this event. And I want to thank also David very much for moderating it. And as I told him, he should really be giving the talk because he is an uh, expert on Chinese linguistics and he's written this very excellent book about it. So I'm hoping to, to be corrected during the talk by him. Anyway, our topic today is Zhou Yaoguang and we call him the father of Pinyin. And as Melinda said, that's not completely correct. There are several fathers of Pinyin, but when you want to sell a book, you have to have a you know, sexy titles. So we call him the father of Pinyin. And the title I use for the English uh, title of the book is The Man Who Made China a Literate Nation. And the reason I chose this title was that when uh, Pinyin began to be promoted in China in 1958, the literacy rate was about 20%. And now it's more than 90%. So the figure that Dr. Joe himself gave was that a more than a billion people through Pinyin were able to read and write characters. So I, I, I think there's no linguistic scholar in history who has an achievement like that. Next slide, please. Now, this is a picture of Dr. Zhou uh, after his, quote, retirement. Uh, he, he lived until he was 111. He was extremely active. He was not retired at all. So I chose this photo because it very much expresses his character, which is he's very open-minded, curious, optimistic, always eager to meet new people, to discuss with them, learn from them. I think this is one of the secrets of his old age. Next slide, please. This is a photo of him in the 1930s when he was a banker in Shanghai. Next slide, please. Now, he was very fortunate in his, in his family. He was born in 1906 in Changzhou in Jiangsu. And I'm sure some of you know, Jiangsu is a very, has a remarkable intellectual tradition and many distinguished intellectuals come from this, this uh, city. And his family was middle class, not very wealthy, but his parents were extremely open-minded and, and, and liberal. So they wanted their son not to have a traditional Chinese Confucian education, but a modern one. So it started in middle school. <clears throat> so he went to middle school and there he learned English, mathematics, world history, many modern subjects, and it was not the traditional curriculum. So this was a great start in life for him. Next slide, please. So from there, he went to St. John's University in Shanghai. I'm sure many of you uh, know about this university. We call it the Harvard of China. Next slide, please. Now, uh, Joe's family didn't have the money to pay the fees, so he was actually preparing to go to another university in Nanjing. But he was, he was a charming uh, young man, and he was introduced to uh, a, lady, a lady who liked him, and she agreed to fund the studies. So thanks to her, he was able to go. And he really took like a duck to water to this university. It was uh, English language medium. Many of the teachers were from the United States. It had a very broad curriculum. 
he studied economics. And what he liked about it was that the the the, the classes were quite short. The, the teachers encouraged the students to do their own studying, develop studying on their own. And this is very rare in China at this time. So he really enjoyed greatly being in St. John's. Next slide, please. And then in 1925 in Shanghai, again, I'm sure many of you know, there were serious disturbances because of attacks between Chinese and Japanese, in which both Chinese and Japanese were, were, were killed. And a group of students went to a, a police station and demanded the release of Chinese students who had been arrested. And the, the city police, who were, of course, controlled by the British, they opened fire and several of the students were killed. And this set off enormous protests across Shanghai. And the students of St. John's demanded to leave the campus and to join these protests. But the people who ran the university refused because they said, if you leave the campus, we cannot guarantee your safety. The situation is very unstable. You might be killed, you might be arrested. So over 500 students and 19 of the faculty felt so strongly over this issue that they left St. John's, which is a really extraordinary decision. You're in the best university in, in China, but you leave. So Dr. Zhou only studied there for two years. And what then happened was they set up a new university, Guanghua, which was uh, private. And the money came from donations from wealthy Chinese. And uh, Dr. Zhou completed his undergraduate education at Guanghua. So he graduated in 1927. He had a degree in political science, but he also studied linguistics and romanization of Chinese as a minor topic. Next slide, please. So the next item was his marriage. And here's a picture of uh, him and his wife at their wedding. Next slide, please. She was from a very uh, prominent family in Suzhou, rich, ed educated, uh, very enlightened. There were four beautiful sisters, and one of them married uh, Shen Chongwen. That's the most famous brother-in-law he had. And uh, Zhou feared he was too poor for her, uh, and he didn't offer good enough prospects. But she very much uh, loved him and so accepted it. And fortunately, her father was a very open-minded person and said it was up to them to decide. So 1933 in April, the two of them married in the YMCA in Shanghai with 100 guests. Next slide, please. So for, for the next stage of his education, Dr. Drell wanted to go to the United States, but he couldn't afford it. I mean, the, the fees were very, very high. So instead, he went to Japan. So he studied at Kyoto University. So this is a photo of Kyoto University at that time. Next slide, please. Now, at that time, as you know, relations between China and Japan were extremely bad. The press of both countries were full of hatred of the other side. So in the Japanese press, there would be a lot of uh, bad words about Chinese people, but Dr. Zhou was able to rise above this. He studied Japanese diligently. He learned Japanese culture. He made many friends among the, 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 the Japanese people. Uh, he studied at Kyoto University. He, he made friends with the, with the teachers and the other students. And uh, again, I really admire him because the atmosphere around it was very poisonous, but he was still able to get the best out of his time there by seeing people as individuals and not as representatives of the government, of the regime that they lived under. Now, during this time, his wife didn't like Japan as much as he did, so she stayed in Shanghai and their son and daughter were born there. Next slide, please. So he worked in banking in Shanghai, and then, of course, uh, the Japanese launched their full-scale invasion of China in 1937, and like tens of thousands of other Chinese, uh, Joe and his family escaped, and they went to Chongqing, which was the wartime capital. 
So this is quite a famous photograph. I'm sure you've seen it before. This is the, the steps leading to the pier where all the boats arrive on the Yangtze River. And Chongqing had no railway and poor roads. So the most important transportation route was the, the uh, Yangtze River. Next slide, please. So during the war, he had an extremely important job. He worked in the Agricultural Bureau, which was under the Ministry of Economic Affairs. And he was the deputy commissioner for Sichuan, which then, as now, is the biggest agricultural province in China. And his job was to secure the provision of food and cotton for the Chinese military and the population. So it was an extremely uh, arduous job and it was covering a huge area. Now, as you know, the Japanese uh, bombed uh, Chongqing often. They bombed civilian areas. The Chinese Air Force was very inadequate and could not uh, repel them. So he and his family moved during the war 36 times because as soon as the Japanese learned where Chinese officials were living, they were bombed that area. So he had to keep moving. In 1942, tragically, he lost his daughter and she uh, suffered from peritonitis. Now, if they were in Shanghai, uh, she would not have died because the medicines were available there, but they were not available in Chongqing, so she died. Next slide, please. So after the war ends, he goes back to banking and he joins the Xinhua Bank. And his bosses are very impressed with him, his personal skills, his language skills, his understanding of economics. So they send him to uh, New York as their representative. Next slide, please. So he spends two years in Wall Street. Next slide, please. And one, one year in London. This is the, the, the city of London. Next slide, please. Now, his time in New York was extremely productive because he saw, he saw that this was an opportunity, a rare opportunity for him to learn about the United States. And because he was a banker and his bank was partnered with Irving Trust, which is a very big bank. So he had an opportunity to meet many uh, American uh, CEOs, uh, senior people in the business world. For example, he met a man called Robert Gregg, who was the founder of one of the two main methods of shorthand. He was much impressed by Shorten. He thought it raised efficiency greatly. So he went out of his way to make friends with and spend time with Americans, not with Chinese. And when he had no um, appointments in the evenings, he would go to the New York Public Library and he would stay there until it closed because he wanted to take the opportunity to read his books. Now, he also traveled to different cities in, in America and there he met Chinese specialists in linguistics, including uh, uh, Chao Yuanren, who's also from Changzhou, and he had developed a system of pinyin. So among the fathers of pinyin, uh, Mr. Zhou is one of the most important. Now, he spent only a year in the UK. He, he, found, that much, he found that less interesting um, Britain was still recovering from the war. It was uh, still having rationing. And then, of course, 1949, the communists take power. And he had to decide what to do, because with his skills, his knowledge of English, his contacts in America, he had three years of foreign exchange earnings, dollar earnings. He could easily have stayed in America. He didn't have to go back to China, it was his choice, but he chose to go back. Next slide, please. So why did he go back? Well, there are many reasons. Uh, the most important, I think his family was there, his wife and children were there, his roots were in China. His son had continued study in Suzhou whilst he was in America and Britain. He wanted his, his son to have a Chinese education. And during World War II, he had met several of the Communist Party leaders, including Zhou Enlai. He met him quite often. And Zhou insisted that after 49, the communists would, would uh, introduce democracy, which had not been introduced by the Kuomintang. 
1949, Chen Duxiu wrote a very important article which also said the same thing. So he believes that once the communists had taken power, they would institute democracy. That was another reason he decided to go back. And I think the third reason was that he was not a member of Kuomintang. He was not a member of the government. He had no, he didn't belong to any of the class enemies of the communists. So I think he felt quite safe. Okay, next slide, please. So he goes back to Shanghai and he becomes a teacher at Fudan University. He writes articles for economic magazines and he continues to work at the Xinhua Bank. But very soon, as you all know, the political atmosphere in, 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 in uh, China changes. There is a campaign against finance, against financiers. And many of the people he worked with on the Bund, in the, in the bank branches, they took their own lives. They were so terrified what was going to happen. And his wife, who was a very, also highly educated, a very talented lady, she would moved to Beijing and she was working in a publishing house. And then uh, Mao Zedong launch, launches um, uh, a movement called San Wu, San Wu, excuse me, San Fan Wu Fan. And for some reason, his wife, his wife is chosen as an anti counter revolution, a big tiger, and is accused of many crimes, none of which she's guilty, of course. And she has to write a 20,000 word confession of her crimes. And she's completely traumatized by this experience. She leaves Beijing, she goes back to Shanghai. She, she almost has a mental breakdown. She says to her husband, I will never go back to Beijing again. And she also says to him, I will never work in a Danway anymore. Because if you're in a Danway, you're a potential target for any future campaign. So although she was an extremely talented lady and she had worked in many different departments, she never worked again in a Danway for the rest of her life. She specialized in Kunju, that was her interest. So she devoted the rest of her, her life to Kunju. And she made a very wise decision because there were so many campaigns that followed. If she had been in the Dan way, maybe she wouldn't have survived. Next slide, please. So that's, this is a poster of that particular campaign. Next slide, please. So, in 1955, uh, uh, Professor Zhou is uh, assigned to leave Shanghai and move to Beijing and join this new uh, institution called the Ch Ch China Character Reform Commission. And he's put in the department which is uh, in charge of developing pinyin. Uh, now, he didn't really want to go. He preferred to be in Shanghai. He was much better paid. But as you know, in those days, there's no choice in the matter. If you're assigned to go, you, 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 you have to go. Next slide, please. Now, here I'm, I'm getting on territory where David is much more of an expert. So please forgive me if I make mistakes. Um, th this issue of what to do about the characters had been on the intellectual agenda since 1911. Um, the Ill illiteracy rate in China was so high that how can China become a, a modern nation if the vast majority of its people cannot read or write? We have to do something about it. What should we do? So there were many different proposals as to what to do. And one of them was by Chinese students who'd gone to the Soviet Union, which was uh, uh, the communist uh, motherland, and they developed something called Xin Wenzi, new words. And this was a form of romanization and they abolished the characters completely. And they wrote letters, magazines and books in this new language. So this was one possible alternative to replace the characters. But after 49, the communists take power. The master to himself, Zhou Enlai, the intellectual class, virulently opposed giving up characters because of course the characters are the history, the culture, the tradition of China. So Joe's department was charged with finding a romanization form. 
So he spent three years uh, of intense work heading a team, developing a romanization system. And one day, uh, the vice minister of education, the Soviet Union came and said to his Chinese counterpart, well, you should make a Cyrillic romanization, not use the Roman letters from Western Europe. And uh, everyone in Dr. Joe's department was trembling that day because the Soviet Union was, of course, the, the, the big brother. But fortunately, the, the, the minister, vice minister, stood firm and said, no, they were sticking with the European letters. But, uh, but uh, Joe was also criticized uh, on, the, on, on the other side by the leftists who called him a, a slave of the West because, of course, they were using uh, letters from Western Europe. As you know, in, in, in Taiwan, they use Popomorpho, which is a system developed in the 1920s, and they use um, uh, signs used from ancient Chinese, which would be a more, uh, a more Chinese form of, of uh, simplification. Next, next. So I'm sure of you, everybody in, who's watching knows, so, so this is what Pinyin looks like. I would just say uh, I studied uh, Mandarin in Taiwan and our teachers forbade us ever to use simplified characters. So the, the, the one at the top, uh, I cannot write it in this way. We can only write in the traditional way. Next slide, please. So 1958, the new government launches three major language reforms and they're still in force until now. So one is Pinyin, one is the spread of Putonghua, and the other is the simplification of the characters. And what happened was that the uh, primary school children go to their Chinese class and they first learn pinyin, maybe six to nine months, and only then they go on to learn characters. So it's a, it's, 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 it's a really remarkable invention. So when they start to learn the characters, the teacher writes the pinyin above, and then they can read it. Now, if they didn't have the pinyin, they would have to learn it from scratch. And of course, it would take much longer. Next slide, please. Now, of course, a lot of other things were going on in China at this time. And Dr. Zhou wrote about them. He didn't write about them at the time. He wrote about them later on when he had more time and more and, and more freedom, um, and he was extremely critical uh, of what he saw going around him, uh, especially, of course, the Great Leap Forward. He estimates the number of dead from starvation at 45 million, which is double the number of Chinese killed by the Japanese during the war, uh, seven times the number of Jews killed by Hitler in World War II. I mean, it just figure we cannot imagine. And he was an economist, and he saw that these campaigns were not only devastating to the population, but they also devastated the economy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 1969, uh, Dr. Zhou and many of his colleagues were sent off to a remote part of Ningxia in, in Western China to a uh, labor camp. Um, and when they went there, they had to swear an oath that they would never return to Beijing. They were, because many of them were intellectuals, they were not allowed to take any books. So Dr. Zhou was very smart. So what he did was he bought 30 copies of Mao's collected works in different languages, and he bought Xinhua dictionaries. So the officials couldn't prevent him taking those on the train. So that's what he took with him when he went to this labor camp. Next slide, please. Um, now, he tells many funny stories of, about life in this uh, labor camp. So I'll just give you two of them, okay? Um, he was in a room with five other people and they were not intellectuals. They were just ordinary staff of this uh, character commission. Um, and they slept uh, on, a, on a board above a kang. You know what is a kang? It's, it's uh, a stove kept warm throughout the night. 
Um, and of course, he'd never had such an experience. And the other five people all slept in the nude because they only had one set of clothing. So they didn't want to, 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 to ruin the clothes by sleeping. So they hung up the suit and they slept in the nude. So as they lie there preparing to sleep, everyone tells stories and tells jokes and talks about the village they came from. And this is evidence of what a fine person Dr. Joe was. Instead of being very upset and angry about this, he sees this as an opportunity to learn about things he never knew about, to make new friends, and he finds it a very constructive experience. The other thing I want to say is one day he and another man were, were sent to guard a pile of sorghum, which they had harvested. And this man was older than he was. And there were three rules for guarding the sorghum. One was you couldn't sit down, you couldn't stand still, and you couldn't converse. So the first day, these two men followed the rules. They didn't sit down, they didn't stand still, and they didn't converse. But on the second day, they realized there was no one else there, so the rules couldn't be enforced. So Dr. Joe starts conversing with this man, and he turns out to be Lin Han Da, who is the vice minister of education of China. Can you imagine? The vice minister of education of China. He had a PhD from Colorado State University. He'd written many, many books, especially children's books. So he was a fount of information and stories. So the next days, while Dr. Doe was guarding the sorghum with him, <laughs> he learned a great deal from Dr. Lin about many things. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is, <laughs> this is the most extraordinary thing that happened in the labor camp. Um, these geese, they liked this uh, place because uh, there were very few people. So there was a big nesting place for geese. So one day they were having a, a morning assembly and they were all out there in the courtyard of this labor camp. And um, Dr. Joe knew that the meeting was going to go on for many hours. So he, he brought a hat with him because it became rather hot. So the geese, after about three hours, they formed formations like an Air Force squadron. And they were led by the squadron commander who would screech with a certain voice. And they, they flew this way and that in a highly orderly way. And the climax came when they all flew downwards and the squadron leader emitted a sound they'd not heard before. And each time the squadron came right over the, the, the people on, on, in, in this assembly, they omitted their excreta. So all the people were completely covered in this. And it was like, you know, guano. It was very sticky. It was very hard to, to get off. And when the local people saw this, they were all amazed. And they said, this happens only every 10,000 years. So Dr. Joe said, ah, this means something very important is about to happen. Next slide please. And indeed, uh, they were informed at a meeting shortly after this that something extraordinary had happened. That was Lin Biao's uh, escape and death in outer Mongolia. And after that, they were permitted to, to go back to Beijing. And, and as he describes it, the whole thing was completely Kafkaesque. Why were they sent there? What was it meant to achieve? Why were they allowed to go back? I mean, no rationale was given for any of this. So they go back to Beijing and he goes back to his apartment and he finds it's completely empty. The Red Guards have removed every piece of furniture, every photograph, every scrap of paper. Nothing remains there at all. And again, Dr. Zhou shows his qualities at this moment because instead of getting angry, he says, OK, that's how it is. Assets are a burden. I have no assets. I will start again. He doesn't get angry and, and, and start craving to get these possessions back. Next, next slide, please. So in his later writings, he's extremely critical, of course, of the Cultural Revolution. He said it actually lasted nearly 20 years, not 10 years. He cites the example of President Liu Xiaoqi. I'm sure you know the story. Um, he was thrown into a crematorium in a bag 
without a name. I once went to the room in Kaifeng where he spent his last hours and uh, the people there told me that uh, he was the president of China lying on this uh, wooden bed and there was no one in attendance. There were no doctors or nurses. He was completely alone and that's how he died. And the question uh, Dr. Zhou says repeatedly is well, what was the purpose of this? Um, education was shut down for 10 years, a whole generation lost the chance of being educated. So his comment was what I put at the top here. Mao did two things in his life. One was to create new China and the other was to destroy it. Next slide, please. Now let's move to more positive news now. So as China opens out to the world, Pinyin starts to become internationally used. And it is accepted by the ISO, which is the Global Organization for Standards, as the global standard for writing Chinese. Next, next slide, please. So that's 1982, and then the UN accepts it, and then 2000 is accepted by the Library of Congress. And as I'm sure you know, this was not a simple matter because of course, Wade Giles, which was the system used in Taiwan, that that was the, the international standard before, and that was the one promoted by the United States. So it wasn't just a question of which was the better system. It was also a question of the political weight. So whilst the UK and the US continued to support Wade Giles, the rest of the world realized that Pinyin was a better system. So that's how it became accepted. Next slide, please. Now, Dr. Zhou is, as I'm sure you've gathered now, he's a very intellectually energetic man. So he's sort of done Pinyin now. He's in energy. What, 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 what's he going to do next? So he becomes one of the editors of the translation of Encyclopedia Britannica. There's a three-man ed editorial board to translate this into Chinese, and he's one of them. Next slide, please. So um, this is a very enormous project and again, a remarkable project. He's able to travel again. He goes to the United States. He lectures at Yale and the United Nations. Uh, his nickname is Joe Baikal, Encyclopedia Joe, because he's interested in everything. In uh, New York City, he met a lady called Roxanne Whitke. Uh, I'm sure some of you know her. She was the lady that wrote the biography of Jiang Qing. Uh, Mao Zedong's wife, and he just says that the then Chinese ambassador Huang Hua invited Whitke to a lunch in Washington and offered her a million US dollars in exchange for the manuscript. And of course, for a, a, an American academic at that time, this is a colossal amount of money, but she refuses it and she, she publishes the book in America. Next slide, please. So he finally retires officially in 1991. He's aged 85, but he doesn't actually retire at all. He moves to his small apartment in, in Beijing, just 50 square meters. And this is the picture you would have seen of him for the next 26 years. So he, he, he works every day in his study and he writes over 20 books during this period. And he write, writes many articles in his in his uh, small studio. Next picture, please. Um, he was offered uh, a larger apartment in a suburb of Beijing, but he refused. He wanted to live in the center and he was not far from Forbidden City. He was a very popular person. He always had visitors, Chinese visitors, foreign visitors, and uh, the foreign visitors always had to bring something. So they would bring Time or Newsweek or some, something he couldn't acquire himself in Beijing. Next slide, please. So he wrote on a wide range of topics uh, as well as linguistics. He wrote on history, culture, and he was very critical of Mao Zedong, of the Soviet model, Soviet economics. He said the Soviet model was a disaster for China in many aspects, ill treatment of intellectuals, fake history, um, 
he said Soviet economics was, was a complete nonsense. The Soviet Union had no economics at all. The market was never, never in play at all. And the Soviet Union collapsed because of its economic system. But China was saddled with this for, for 30 years. And um, many people wondered why he was allowed to write and say this openly. And his answer was that he was old and, you know, it would not look good if someone of his age was arrested or interrogated. And he was the father of opinion officially. So he had a considerable status. So that protected him. Next slide, please. Uh, 2002, his wife passed away. She was 92. That was a terrible blow to him. After that, he stopped sleeping in the bed that they shared, and he, he only slept in this sofa that he had in his study. 2015, his son passed away. He was 80. He was a meteorologist. And his visitors sometimes said to him, um, what's the secret of your old age? And his answer was that uh, God was too busy. Uh, he's forgotten me. But my take on it is the reverse. I think God saw what he was doing, what he was writing, what he was saying, and thought he was a very important Chinese intellectual. And so uh, wanted him to live longer. So I, I think he was being modest, but I think he misunderstood God's plan for him. Next slide, please. So finally, uh, January 14th, 2017, he passed away at the age of 111. And that day, a man was going to visit him by the name of Vinton Gray Surf, who was one of the founders of the internet. And this is another enormous achievement of Dr. Zhou Yaoguang, in that, as you know, pinyin is one of the main ways that Chinese and foreigners like me access the Chinese internet. And the internet has played such a, a key role in the modernization of China. It's so important that a way to access the internet is, is extremely important. So this man, Mr. Surf, he was going to visit Dr. Joe that afternoon and was going to give him a, a, a plaque to thank him for his help. In, in, in enabling Chinese to access the internet. So it's not only pinyin, but the use of pinyin in, in, in being able to access the internet. And yes, so final quote, um, uh, foreign visitors would always say, ah, Dr. Zhou, you're the father of, of pinyin. He said, no, no, I'm the son of pinyin. So I think that's both uh, his humility, uh, but also, uh, accuracy because, uh, yeah, I think Pinyin had many fathers. Anyway, thank you very much, and I welcome your questions. Okay, thanks, Mark. That was amazing. Um, I had read a lot about Zhou Guang, but I learned many things from your speech and your talk, and it's, it's, just, it's very fascinating. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, and I have some questions. Uh, we would encourage more audience pe uh, people to, uh, you know, ask some questions, and I will look at them, and, and we will start up with some of those when when those build up to enough that we can actually start a conversation. But I want to start with the the ending of your talk, and also the the last part of Joyo Guang's life, uh, because it does seem that uh, his his trajectory, um, you know, as someone who had given up a, a splendid life. A possible life in a, in the United States, and chose to go back to China and and make contributions to the to the new China, and then the way he was treated and his wife was treated during the Cultural Revolution, you can sort of understand where, where when he became an uh, in old age, he took full advantage of his immunity. <laughs> he as he rightly points out, being an elderly person, and also the father of Pinyin, that he could be as outspoken as he once wanted to be. I remember he had a quote. Uh, he he said, I really like people cursing me, uh, which is interesting. I think probably something that he didn't come from childhood. It was something that was built up through the, through uh, his experiences. Uh, 
so this, this, I just would like to point that out. Uh, by the way, with, with my book, uh, A Billion Voices, when uh, when they tried to bring it in a shipment into, the, into uh, China, uh, they actually returned it back to Hong Kong because of the of the photograph of Zhou Yuguang in the book, and they said we can't sell this in the, in the mainland China. So he was at that point just a few years ago he was still controversial. Um, but I want to I want to bring up a question um, that uh, that that Melinda has raised actually, and I think it's very uh, important and interesting at the at the end of your talk here. She says, uh, Joe's candor and criticism of the Cultural Revolution and the other topics, what sort of ceremony and language tonality surrounded his death slash funeral? And did Chinese luminaries or leaders attend his funeral or send funeral wreaths? What do you know about his demise and how it was treated in the Chinese press and especially among Chinese leaders? Did he get the acknowledgement that he deserved? No, or was no, no. He had a very warm funeral. Among He had many, many friends especially among the intellectual class. Um, they respected him greatly. Uh, you know, 110th birthday, 105th birthday. There were big birthdays for him. There were extremely warm and moving speeches by these other intellectuals. So they were the ones who celebrated him after at his funeral. But no, luminaries didn't come. And the, the passing was uh, described in a very low-key way in the official media. So I, that example of your book, I think, is, is very telling. I, I hadn't heard that. I, I didn't realize it was, quote, so severe. But yeah, I think that was the official view of him. Yeah. Well, they're consistent. <laughs> it's, it's pretty disgusting. Um, there, uh, speaking of Melinda, I don't want to break <laughs> bringing her up as part of this, but part of a, a, a something that I saw in the article that you wrote, that published in the Royal Lady Alex Society, is that in April 1942 in Zhejiang province, Zhou uh, uh, Yuguang actually met James Doolittle, the, the famous, uh, one of the most famous pilots of World War II who led the, the squadron of bombers over Tokyo. Uh, and, then, and then when the, uh, when the, when the pirates landed or bailed out and parachuted in China, you said that uh, Zhou served as an interpreter between Doolittle and his fellow pilots. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's a fascinating piece of history I didn't know. Well, it's an amazing story. His his boss in, in Chongqing asked him to go to Shanghai. This is during the war while Japan is occupying Shanghai. So, as you know, the, 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 the front line was not impermeable. You could go across. So he's on his way back. And he's in Zhejiang. And um, this uh, American planes land there. And the Americans are donating the planes to the Chinese Air Force. So suddenly, the, the Chinese Air Force find themselves with Doolittle and his other pilots. But no one can speak any English. So um, he's, he's uh, asked to become an interpreter. So, of course, it was for him absolutely fascinating to, to sit in. And on the one side, we have very important members of the Chinese Air Force. And here's Doolittle and... Uh, the, the other um, American airmen. And correct me if I'm wrong, David, but I think Doolittle was the man who led the first air raid on Tokyo. Am I right? You, this, the reason I mentioned Melinda is she overlaps a great deal with this story. Yeah. If it's not inappropriate, Melinda, maybe you could come in here and say a few things. Here. <laughs> Okay, if, if first I should say I wasn't there, and I'm not quite, <laughs> you might think I'm really old, and I am really old. <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean overlapping no, no, in no. time. No, sorry. No, no I, I find this fascinating. I find this fascinating, and um, I'm glad you brought it up, David, because I, even though I, I, I've seen Mark recently, and we've talked a lot about the book, I every time I keep forgetting to ask him for a, a lot about this. Um. The reason I know about the Doolittle Raiders and why it's um, an, a subject of curiosity to me is because my father had also been in Zhejiang, just tr trying to get from Shanghai back to Western China, and you know had been in touch with people smugglers who were going to smuggle him across the the lines because he was in, also in Japanese occupied territory, and then one night they came to him and said, "Do you do you speak English?" Which 
he didn't know why that was relevant, but he said, yes, I, I, I went, it, it was um, some of my courses at Tsinghua University were in English. So some of my textbooks were in English and I do speak English. So they said, okay, bring your suitcase, come with us. And they, they brought him, they didn't tell him anything. They brought him to a place and pushed him in a room. And then there were these, there were five disheveled American pilots who had just kind of crash landed their plane near, not too far away from Ningbo and were surrounded by Chinese, but nobody knew who the other was. They couldn't speak with each other. The Chinese who found them were very rural and isolated. They didn't know, they, they knew they were foreigners, but they didn't know what foreigners, they didn't know anything. So he became their translator. Um, at first for that group of five, it was crew number two. And then um, for, for other raiders, because they sort of congregated in um, Air Force, uh, Chinese Air Force facilities afterwards. So yeah, so Doolittle um, had led this mission, which began as a secret mission in April 1942. And it was intended to be the America's revenge for Pearl Harbor. So it was a secret mission. It was a, a sneak attack on the Japanese home islands. Now, they that, why this was important in World War II is because at the time, the Japanese thought they were invincible at home. They they had enough maritime defenses, they thought, to protect against anyone coming close enough to hit them at home. And meanwhile, they were on a roll, you know, um, invading various Southeast Asian countries in, in, in the spring of 1942. So they were taken completely by surprise by this. It had been a mission um, prepared and trained for in total secrecy. And... Um, the, the, there were 16 aircraft, 80 airmen. And when they were flying over Japanese cities, it was so unexpected that some of the Japanese civilians on the ground were waving at them thinking they were Japanese planes, but in fact, they were American planes. And <laughs> um, the, the damage done by these attacks was not huge by, by military, physical military standards, but, but it, it, it did play a big role because it shook, uh, well, first of all, it, it was a huge morale boost for Americans, as you can uh, imagine. Um, it was um, a shock, came as a shock to the Japanese. And then ever after, they had to devote a certain amount of, a certain amount of their defensive capabilities to just simply defending their home islands. These are, these are resources that might have been used to kind of keep rolling through Southeast Asia, you know, through Indonesia, you know, get, it, get to Australia. You know, it could have been, it, they could have had more muscle outside of Japan, except that they were worried about what would happen to Japan. And it also emphasized um, the battle of the aircraft carriers. Um, the reason why these Americans were able to surprise the Japanese is because they took a really heavy, normally land-based bomber aircraft and took off from an aircraft carrier, which meant they had to take off on a really short runway. Never been done before, but they did it with that particular plane and they did it successfully. It was a total amaz amazing thing that they did. Um, so then ever after in the Pacific, um, some Japanese admirals in particular were just obsessed with the, the battle of the aircraft carriers and it led to a spectacular defeat of the uh, ja Japanese were defeated at the at the very famous Battle of Midway, um, partly partly because the Americans were better at car uh, carrier warfare, and partly because they had a lot of luck in their favor. Mm. So that's 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 my connection. But thank you so much, um, uh, Mark. Well, Melinda, let me ask Melinda, you, Melinda. Yeah. Let me ask you first. Did you did you know? Uh, that that Joey Oguang had had been the interpreter for the the soldiers uh, there, or was this? Did Marks Brook, uh, you know, no, was that the first you heard of that? I, I knew that he had been, and I I was always uh, I I knew that it. Well, we'll put it this way: I knew that he had been, but at the time that I knew it, I I didn't know that he was such an open and accessible and interesting man. And of course I'm kicking yeah. myself for not having sought him out to interview him. I knew it wasn't, um, you know, I like none of the airmen, uh, the original Doolittle Raiders that I knew um, spoke that much about him. 
so I don't know actually who they who they talk to, um, mm. and and you know I I didn't have any reason from the original pilots to to seek him out, but of course I still should have really sought him out, especially you know he was in Beijing and I I was in Beijing, and so that's that's a big regret of mine. Um, but Mark, let me ask you: Did did he have any writings or diaries about this early encounter with Doolittle, or is there any? Kind yeah, of yeah. He, he wrote he wrote extensively, and oh, so well, okay. that's how I found wow. out about it. He described it, so that's, hey, that's how yeah, I knew. Yeah. I I I uh, I'll be interested in that. Thank you so much. Fascinating footnote, isn't it? Really amazing. This, mm -hmm. Mark, Mark, this should all be a footnote in your book written by Melinda, I think. <laughs> uh, it's it's amazing how these kind of serendipitous little uh, angles come through in, in in lots of unexpected ways. Yes, that's this is fascinating. These these are connections I had never imagined and I never heard of. I know, I know. <laughs> me neither. And to have the have you here and that your father was involved in that is really amazing. Yeah, um, right. Any questions from the audience? He did say he was the he was the son of. Uh, well, here's a question uh, that you and I can both answer. Maybe the I think this might be I don't know who's write, written this question, but Chinese students explained to me that Zhou Youguang and used German and other languages as well as English when creating Pinyin. Do you think it would have been better to use only English, remembering that Western schools teach phonetics to young students and have them pronounce words correctly? I understand what this question is about, and you, and I'm sure you do as well, Mark. That, that, that one of the purposes of of Pinyin, because of course, Zhou Yuguang had a lot of models to choose from, and it was not the first uh, romanization method or the first phonetic method. Uh, the the linguist John de Francis, who was a, 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 a you know a, a worshipped Zhou Yuguang, uh, estimated that in the between the 18th and 19th century, uh, the 19th and 20th century, there were over a thousand different uh, phonetic uh, systems to phoneticize or romanize Chinese, a thousand. So uh, lots of people were trying to do this. And what, but I think what they're talking about is pe people who are critical of Pinyin look at it and they say, why these ZH and all these funny things I can't pronounce? Some of them are you're sort of intuitive and others aren't. That uh, uh, Joyo Kwang's quote was, uh, they used to laugh at us because it took us uh, three years just to deal with 26 letters. <laughs> but it is a very tricky thing to come up with a system like this. People, don't, if you're not a linguist, you don't realize what a mo monumental task this was. Because first of all, it had to be the, the, it had to represent the sounds of Chinese with unique alphabetic combinations. Hopefully, some of the combinations would would bear enough resemblance to European languages and Amer and English that it would be easier for foreigners to to pronounce them. Even though you you know you're not you're not going to find any perfect pronunciation system or a, a, a phonetic system. And also, they, he wanted it to be uh, not like Wade Giles with diacritics with lots of commas and things, uh, because that would make it hard to be used. They wanted it to be used in, in magazines, newspapers, and all sorts of things overseas that would not need any special characters. And, um, and they also wanted it to be something that, would, that, that could be used as a teaching tool because each of the, each of the, uh, the different letter combinations represent, they're basically the same as Bopomofu that you talked about, except they're done with alphabetic characters. So I understand what this person is, is, is asking. Um, but any comments uh, on on why yeah, on, I mean, on the I struggle he had? The point, the point the point is this is written for Chinese to use, right? Not yes, for us. Right. That's now, right. Now, David, you well, and me. And, well, that, and, that's not thousands. quite. That's that's not quite right. That's, Mark, I think it was written for both. Well, yeah, but primarily it's for I Chinese. Think trying so, to do two things. Yeah, I mean, but, yes, uh, but right. of course, if you show opinion to someone who's never seen it before. You know, they find it very hard to read because of the Q and X's and C's. But, you know, right. uh, Dr. Joe and his colleagues, they spent three years of uh, intense work dealing with this question. And because, you know, Chinese is, is, is so generous, it's, 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 it's not meant to be written in R Romanized letters. So they have to find the way to make it as exact as possible. And remember that the Chinese children in the primary school, they learn 
how to pronounce. The teacher tells them how to pronounce. So when they start reading the characters, they already have the ability to to, to pronounce the, the Qs and the, the, the Zs and so forth. So um, uh, he did have many models. You know, he, he wrote books about romanization in different countries. So uh, not just English, not just French. I'm sure he looked at, at, at other yes. languages. And I mentioned before we started the talk, at a previous lecture I gave, a man got up and said, did he use Albanian as one of his models? <laughs> Which is quite a clever question because Charan and Albania had very close relations at that time. And I'm, I'm afraid I don't know anything about the Albanian language. So indeed, maybe in Albanian, they, they have some use of Z and Q. And so I, mm -hmm. I think Dr. Joe had a really encyclopedic view and he was willing to, to, to look at whatever he thought would be suitable. Yeah, and it did take a long time and many people, as you say. Someone yeah. has asked, why didn't they just use Bopomofu? That's a very good question. Um, my guess is it's, it's politics because Bopomofu was developed in the 1920s. It was adopted by the uh, Komendan government, but because of all the war with Japan, the, the war with the communists, you know, it was never properly spread across China um, in the way the pinyin was. So, you know, it was not very well used in 1949. So indeed they could have used it. And it's better than pinyin because it's based on old traditional Chinese characters. But my guess is it's politics because that was the one used in the Republic of China. So we we have to use a different one. And, you know, that was the same with me when I was studying in Taiwan in, in, in the eighties. Um, we couldn't use pinyin because it was used in the mainland. You know, mm -hmm. we could only use Popomopo. I think that's why he was vilified as being, uh, you know, a slave to the West because lots of people did see the adoption of a of an alphabetic system to be sort of giving in to the, you know, the, the scriptural. Mm, yeah, yeah. I guess the alphabet was better. And the, the, the Bopomofu at least was based on Chinese characters and looked like Chinese characters. So so you're, yeah. so there was an argument that went on. It was very controversial. Uh, mm. Apparently, yeah. Zhou Guang also <laughs> mentioned or something that, that Stalin had said to Mao that, oh, you shouldn't use uh, romanization. You shouldn't use letters for your, uh, for your, rom for your phonetization method. Yeah, yeah I, something he, that looks like Chinese yeah, to be right. phonetization. Yeah, did say that to method. him. And Mao came back from Moscow and said, it's, I think the term is minzu xing, minzu, national characteristic. Mm -hmm. But as, as I recall, he, 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 came, he met Mao, what, 19, he met Star in 1950. So I think there were three years when the scholars tried to come up with something and they failed. So that was why in 55, they started with, with, with uh, uh, working on pinion. So I think they tried, they tried one and it didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of ironic or sad that these three big uh, cornerstones of, of the new language reform, the, the, the uh, pinion, and the civil like characters were passed in the same year as as when they uh, instigated the Great Leap Forward. <laughs> so those are four very important uh, programs that were initiated in the same year with very different um, results, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a little about, I'd like to ask about this huge contrast between the life that he was living in in the United States. I mean, he actually met Albert Einstein. I'd like to know more about that, if you could talk about it. But also the fact that then suddenly back in China, he was working, he was, you know, in a Danway uh, cafeteria, you know, uh, in very poor conditions. And he actually caught sight of the the former, the emperor, the emperor, the, the last emperor, Puyi, eating in this canteen. And, you know, oh, no, no, that's... David, that was a good place to have lunch because he was a member <laughs> of the CPPCC and Puyi was also. And oh, so that was that actually was a time. good, that was a good place to get lunch. 
Oh, yeah, because it was a time of severe food shortages, you know? Oh, yeah, but that's you right, see, yeah. If, you were, if you were a member of CPVC, you could go to the CPVC, uh, we shouldn't call canteen restaurant, you know, and they had, um, you know, reasonable food there. So he used to go there all the time because there was so little food that you could buy in the market. And um, uh, Puyi was a big fan of traditional opera. So that's what they used to talk about because Mrs. Mrs. Zhou is one of the leading experts in the world on Kunju. So that's what they used to, to, to talk about. I remember walking past a building and uh, like a four-story building looked very well appointed and I was about to go and enter and see what it was. And the man at the door said, no, 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 you're not allowed to come here. And I said, what's this? He said, it's a Te Gong Shang Dian. So this was a shop for, oh. for Carter's middle and high rank. And it sold goods that were not available in the um, regular markets. So the CPPC mm -hmm. canteen was uh, similar. And I, was, I mentioned this to one of my Chinese friends. I said, but is this socialism? You have shops with with nice goods for for the carders, which ordinary people can't buy. And he said, "What are you talking about?" He said, "What about your countries? You know, you have Harrods, you have um, what's it called, Blo Bloomingdale's, Neumann, right. Marcus. You have all these shops. Well, the poor, uh, there's nothing to stop them going in there. They can enter, but they, they can't <laughs> afford to buy anything." So he said, "It's the same everywhere. So stop criticizing us." He said, <laughs> "Yeah." Someone in the audience asked, how many languages did Joe actually know or actually speak? Or Well, it would be uh, um, uh, his native language, I mean, Jiangsu, Jiangsu Hua, and then yeah. Shanghai Hua, and then Putong Hua, and then English, and then French, and then Japanese. Yeah, he, he knew all of those. Yeah, Amazing. I thought it's very shrewd of him to take these Chairman Mao's Little Red Book in various languages and a Xinhua <laughs> Zidian. That's a very good way to spend your a very good way to learn languages. Uh, that's how Mao. That's how Mao learned for English. By the way, they just taught him phrases from from his Little Red Book. Uh, and, and you know, and he wrote books. I mean, he you know he was busy in the evenings in this labor camp reading these, and then when he went back to Beijing, books came out of it. So. He didn't waste any time. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was trying to see. Uh, this is, I think we know the answer to this question, but what someone asked, could Pinyin, and I guess you could add, you know, even the simplified characters, have ever been accepted in China without the strong centralized government mandating it? I think Pinyin or Papa Mofo before it were you know completely new things i think they were very difficult for people to accept so yeah i think that's a good question i think because the china the chinese communist party had established a very firm grip on the country and it was able to set up primary schools and send teachers and uh, make everyone learn it yeah i think i think yeah it's critical um for its its success now the question of the simplified characters i mean david i'm, sh I'm sure you're more of an expert than me but I, as i said I, i'm afraid i <laughs> i did all my learning in taiwan and my teachers had a very uh very passionate opinion on this question oh of course and, yeah and so um we recently went to, to taiwan and i met one of my teachers and she this is what she said she said now Chinese illiterate. Most Chinese write characters um, on a keyboard. They don't write with their hands anymore. That's right. Well, with a keyboard, you 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 write the pinyin or the bopomorpho, and it gives you the the choice of characters. It gives you the simplified ones and the traditional ones. So she said, "There's no reason for simplified characters anymore," because. You know, people know, they know opinion, and the traditional character is much better. So the reason for them in the 50s was that the, so many people were illiterate. So we have to find an easy way for people to, to, to learn the characters. But now the literacy rate in the mainland is so high. So 
uh, this was this was how that now the, the government should uh, abolish the simplified characters and just switch back to the traditional ones. That's what she said. Uh, brilliant. I think that's a brilliant observation. The the, the in even in the mainland, the pe people can't even write the simplified characters anymore. Even though at the mm. time the idea was to to boost literacy, I think mm. the in my book I mentioned I think there's only about a twelve point one twelve point something percent. Uh, savings in strokes by switching and i think i think if i'm not mistaken it was it was joe guang who said that the only the only good thing about or the no the only uh, result of the simplified characters was simply to deepen the chasm between the mainland and taiwan <laughs> which which kind of is to your point right now there's really no reason that they should be using simplified characters at this point they might as well, well, well can i can i say a slightly objectionable word Sure. I mean, if I ask if Melinda says okay, it's okay with me. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> when I discuss this with my Taiwan friends, they become quite uh, passionate, and one of them uses the word "tan ti zi," "tan fei de tan," "tan ti zi," because they cut the limbs off. And of right. course, the main, the the best example of this is "what I need I," and in the simplified version, the heart has been removed. Yes. I mean, this is so absurd that when you discuss this with a mainland friend, they have nothing to say. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. how can it be that love exclude the heart? So yeah. I think there are many cases where by simplifying, removing parts of it, it, it makes it meaningless. So, um, um, yeah, I, 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 w I wish everyone would adopt the same traditional characters. That's my personal opinion. This one from Mark Wester, I really, I think he's really got a good question there. Any opinions about the so-called drift of Pinyin over the past couple of years, starting with the choice of nicknames for the mascots for the 2022 Winter Olympics? Bing Dun Dun and Shui Rong Rong, spelled B-I-N-G-D-W-E-N-D-W-E-N, -E -E and Shui Rong Rong, spelled S-H-U-E-Y-R-H-O-N-R-H-O-N. -R 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 know that that's not how it's spelled in Pinyin. Um, and now this year, people ref official media referring to the year of the dragon as the year of the long L double O N G, specifically straying away from the standard pinion long L O N G. What's going on here? What is there some kind of subtle message we're getting here or what? <laughs> Well, well, I mean, Melanie, you can answer this much better because you're, you know, you're living in Beijing, I'm living in Hong Kong. But my my guess would be, you know, these are young people; they they just want to try something new. You know, if you're doing an ad campaign, you know, if you spell it differently to the standard way, you'll get more attention. Um, you know, and these are these are mascots for the games. It's it's you know it's a, a, it's a brand. You know, so. It's not a change of the system. It's just, just uh, you know, um, playing about. Um, right. I mean, that would be what my I, guess. You're, you're, yeah, I mean, you're I, living, you're living what there. I heard, you what I heard about from the Olympic uh, people from the Olympic Committee that one of the reasons, because it was, it did get a lot of publicity when foreigners would try to pronounce Bing and then D U N D U N, it came out so different from the Chinese. I'd say done done or something but they said let's try and write something that foreigners will at least come a little bit closer to the original to the actual chinese so it was an, it, it was again a, a little bit of the attempt that I went with the origins opinion a little bit to at least come up with something that would that would uh, remind or have some kind of phonetic resemblance to the actual sounds uh, with, I hadn't heard the, the the long thing, but yeah, the problem is that foreigners just say long, long, and with right. with two O's they might say loom. Um, I think in your book, David, you you pointed out that 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 very humorous example of the word guang, guang. It was guang. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is right. a noise that Jackie Chan made, you know, when he was doing one of his commercials, and something like hit him, and he made the word. He said the sound guang, and then people started analyzing guang. What tone is it? Uh, how do you spell it in pinyin? And especially how do you write? Finally, it was decided that the writing of this word, which was like totally made up thing by Jackie Chan, you know, just probably emerged. 
um, they would write it by using the two Chinese characters that make up his Chinese name, one as the top radical and one as the bottom radical. Do I have it right, Dave? And then that became the word dong. Yes. yes. And as, Mark, as Mark suggested, we could go on all night. And I apologize in advance uh, to those whose questions are still coming in. But I think we will have to wrap it up now. Some people haven't had their, their, their dinner yet, even possibly. But thank you both so much. Um, Mark, this has been fantastic. And, and David, I'm so glad that, that, that you, you persevered and were able to come. For those who don't know you, actually, David had just come out of the hospital having, having a mild tummy bug. And um, he's done a great job of moderating. So this shows the dedication to the topic. Two great experts, um, wonderful talk.